Hey there, and welcome back to another video on first language acquisition. In this video, I'd like to discuss how children learn how to put clauses together. In other words, how they learn to combine and build up complex syntactic units. Now, why do children need to do this? There are several functions of language that require you to use complex syntax. For example, if you want to tell a story, there are several participants, there are several actions that happen, there's a sequence of time, and all of these pieces of information need to be marked syntactically so that you can communicate those meanings. Or, for example, if you want to give an explanation of how something happened, yeah? or if you want to make a plan, a project that you want to carry out together with someone else, what should we do first? Uh, what tools do we need and what is the end result that we hope to achieve. In order to communicate these meanings, you need complex syntax and that's what we're going to talk about in this video. So, let's go. In a way, we're continuing our journey towards complex syntax that we've started with hollow phrases, pivot schemas, item-based constructions and abstract constructions. So syntactic marking of participants is still important. Categorization of events and scenes is important. But as we will see, there are further processes that come into play that are important when we combine clauses. What I'll have to say in this video draws on chapter 7 of Michael Tomasello's book, Constructing a Language, which is a usage-based introduction to first language acquisition. If you want to read up on the experiments and the studies that I'll be discussing in this video, uh, you need to look at pages 243 to 265. Yeah? So all the references are in there, a lot more info. Uh, have a look at the source. Okay, so without further ado, let me give you a quick definition of what a clause is, because that's a term that you may not be familiar with. So a clause is a linguistic structure that contains a verb and its arguments. And that makes it similar to other notions that you're probably familiar with, such as a sentence or a verb phrase. How is a clause different from a sentence or a verb phrase? So a clause can be independent or dependent. <clears throat> so, an independent clause is what you know as a sentence. For example, she plays the guitar. We have a verb and we have its arguments, a subject and an object. Yeah? And she plays the guitar can stand on its own. So, it's a clause but also a sentence. Things are different in she knows how to play the guitar. So, how to play the guitar is a dependent clause. Yeah, it's a verb, it has an argument, but it's dependent on a structure that linguists call matrix clause. She knows. Okay. Um, second characteristic of clauses is that their verbs can be finite or non-finite. Again, finite verbs, uh, finiteness in general, is a characteristic that has to do with the inflections that we find on verbs. In a sentence, in an independent clause, a verb is fully finite. That is, it is inflected for person, for tense, for things like aspect and other categories that your language may require. Um, but often we find verbs that are not fully inflected. Yeah? So that, for example, there is no tense inflection or no person inflection. <clears throat> In a clause, you may find verbs that are not fully finite. Uh, let's look at it's incredible how she plays the guitar. Well, in this clause, uh, the verb has an inflection for third person singular present tense. So there the verb is actually finite. But in she enjoys playing the guitar, well, here we have an ing form that is not inflected for tense or for person. So this is a verb form that is not fully finite. There are different ways of creating complexity in language, and Tomasello distinguishes two kinds uh, that he calls clause integration and clause expansion. So clause integration allows you to create complexity by connecting two or more clauses, for example, with a conjunction. So in an example like, I'd like to go, but I don't have time, we have two clauses, I'd like to go, I don't have time, and they are linked 
by way of a conjunction. Okay, so this process will be called clause integration. These two clauses are now integrated into a larger syntactic structure. There's also the strategy of clause expansion, where we make a nominal construction that is an argument of a clause more sentence-like, more clause-like. Okay, so this is a way of sneaking in a verb and its participants into a nominal structure. And uh, the strategy that English grammar provides for that, and also other languages, is the strategy of relative clauses. So when we have a relative clause construction, such as the dog that ran away, it's still a noun phrase, okay? But uh, it now contains a verb and potentially further arguments of that verb. Clause integration, clause expansion, two strategies to create syntactic complexity. Right, um, there are three parts to this video uh, corresponding to three different syntactic structures that I want to talk about. We'll start out with complement clauses, so structures like I think this is a good idea, where the clause this is a good idea is a complement of the matrix clause, I think. Then we'll talk about relative clauses, so the dog that ran away will come back to us at some point. And we'll talk about conjoined clauses, like it's nice, but it is very expensive. Okay, so let's go and talk about complement clauses. Complement clauses are structures such as the one that you see here. The mouse thought that the cheese was tasty. Now, you notice that I drew a syntactic tree here, not in order to scare you, but to make one point explicit, namely that uh, the complement clause, this part here, that the cheese was tasty, occurs in a syntactic position where we usually find an object of a transitive verb. Okay, so in this structure, we have a subject noun phrase, the mouse, we have a verb that goes together with that subject, thought, and we have the complement clause in a position where the complement clause is the sister, the syntactic sister of the verb. And usually when you think of ordinary transitive verbs like eat or see, um, this position, the sister of the verb, is occupied by the object of the transitive verb. So you might find the mouse ate the cheese or the mouse saw the cat, and in these cases, this position would be occupied by a nominal structure that is the object of the transitive verb. So, with verbs like think, we may have complements that are clausal, that are more complex, okay, that don't just consist of a noun, but rather of a verb and its complements. So in this case, we have the verb was, we have a subject, and we have what linguists call a um, subject predicate, okay? Tasty. Right, um, so let me give you a few labels for the parts of this structure. I already mentioned that the complement clause here is the object of the verb think, okay? Um, I already mentioned the term matrix clause, so the uh, subject noun phrase together with the verb, <clears throat> they form what linguists call the matrix clause of a complement clause construction. So the whole thing consists of the matrix clause and the complement clause. <clears throat> Next to the verb thought, you see this abbreviation CTV that stands for complement taking verb. And there are three important types of complement taking verbs. Uh, complement taking verbs can be verbs of cognition, like thinking, remembering, imagining, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, they can be verbs of perception, see, hear, uh, or they can be verbs of an utterance, like say, shout, whisper. Why these three? Yeah? Cognition, perception, utterance. Uh, it's because the things that you think about or the things that you see or the things that you talk about, they can be more complex than just a single nominal structure. Yeah? 
<clears throat> when you eat something, well, that thing is going to be an object. But when you see something, that is going to be a situation yeah, with different people acting, different activities happening. So that is conceptually more complex, and hence it's also syntactically more complex. Complement clauses can not only appear in the object position of a transitive verb, they can also appear in the subject position. So here on this slide you see what linguists call a subject clause. Yeah? That would be a complement clause that appears in the subject noun phrase position. <clears throat> that the cheese was tasty surprised the mouse. The structure is different because the complement clause comes at the very beginning, yeah? but the overall logic is very similar since we have a clausal structure that appears in a place where we ordinarily would see a nominal structure. Okay, um, so in this case the complement clause is the subject of the verb surprise. Yeah? We have the complementizer and we have the clause and that is a subject complement clause construction. <clears throat> in English, there are several different types of complement clauses that I wanted to mention briefly. So all the examples that you've seen so far are that clauses. I thought that the cheese was tasty. But there are others, okay? Uh, there are two infinitive complement clauses. I expect to hear from John. There are in clauses. I like traveling to new places. And there are WH clauses. I wonder what they will do next. In each case, yeah, in each case, the complement clause appears in a position that is syntactically the sister node to the complement taking verb, thought, expect, like, wonder, and so on and so forth. With all of this in mind, let's turn to children and let's check out their early complement clauses. Now, despite the fact that complement clauses are syntactically complex, these structures emerge actually quite early, namely between two and a half and three years of age. And the things that kids say, I've given you four examples here, I think he's gone, I bet it's a ball, let's see if it works, or watch how I do it. Now what's interesting about these structures is that, for one thing, uh, kids don't seem to use what I call subject complement clauses, okay, where the clause replaces the subject NP. Rather, what we have here are complement clauses where the clausal structure appears in the object position. I think, and then the object of think is he's gone. I bet. What do you bet? The object of that is it's a ball. Let's see if it works and watch how I do it. Okay? So kids lean towards object complement clauses. That's the first important insight. And then the second important insight concerns the complement-taking predicates. Think, bet, see, watch, and so on and so forth. Now given that complement clauses appear early in children's speech, we need to ask ourselves what it is that children know that allows them to use these structures. Uh, more specifically, if children use complement clause constructions, is it the case that they have mastered a certain syntactic rule that states that some verbs, such as think or see, they take subjects or objects that have the syntactic form of a clause rather than an NP? Or are children's early complement clauses something different? Namely, are they perhaps another instance of pivot schemas that are just a little bit more complex than the nominal pivot schemas that we've been looking at earlier? So you could easily imagine a pivot schema with the shape, I think it's X, okay? That has the structure of a complement clause, but it may not require the complex syntactic knowledge that you can integrate one clause into another. Okay, same thing with let's see if it verbs. If you just remember the let's see if it part, yeah, and the fact that you can integrate several verbs into that slot there, you don't actually need to know about the internal hierarchical syntactic structure that we saw on the earlier slides. So, what do children really know when they're using complement clause constructions, and how can we investigate that issue?
Here's an experiment that tries to investigate how young children understand complement clause constructions. Um, the experiment is designed in such a way that we have a protagonist, a boy, and this protagonist has an attribute. He bought oranges. Okay. Now, importantly, that boy also tells us something. He says, I bought apples. Yeah? That is the setup of the experiment. And in the test phase of the experiment, the participating children needed to answer a question, namely, what did the boy say he bought? Now, there you recognize a complement clause construction. Yeah? The boy said he bought apples. Um, and you and I know how to parse this question and how to respond to it. But how did the children respond? You notice that the results show that children under four years of age generally respond with the boy bought oranges, which is evidently what the boy did, but crucially it's not what the boy said. It's only after four years of age that uh, children understand this complement clause construction and realize that the complement taking verb is what they need to pay attention to here. Yeah? So even though complement clauses appear early in children's speech, uh, that doesn't mean that they have mastered the syntactic dependencies that you and I understand to be at work in complement clause constructions. Let me talk for a bit about a study that tries to address children's complement clause constructions on their own terms. So this was a corpus-based study conducted by Diesel and Tomasello, and they hypothesized that kids' first complement clause constructions should have a set of recognizable structural characteristics. First of all, they hypothesized that matrix clauses of these constructions should be highly formulaic. Things like I think or I bet, which are holistic chunks. Okay, so these are things that you can memorize as units. Um, second, they hypothesized that kids' matrix clauses should not contain any independent proposition. So you and I, when we are using complement clause constructions, we can say things like, John was convinced that he had left his wallet in the drawer. There are two propositions in there. Yeah? One is in the complement clause, wallet is in the drawer, and one is in the matrix clause, John is convinced of something. Yeah? Kids' complement clause constructions don't work like that. There is one proposition, yeah? so in I think it's in there, it's in there, that is the complement clause that carries the proposition, and I think is merely a marker of attitude where you indicate how likely you find that something is. Right. And then the third characteristic has to do with the conceptual and formal embedding of the complement clause into the matrix clause. So um, kids' complement clauses should not be conceptually or formally embedded into the matrix clause. That means no shared reference. What that means is that in John was convinced that he had left his wallet in the drawer. John appears in the matrix clause and also as a pronoun in the complement clause. When you have something like, I think it's in there, I, that appears in the matrix clause, it, that appears in the complement clause, the same referent doesn't reappear in both, in both parts of the complement clause construction. Also, um, the that complementizer, okay, that's an overt syntactic marker of embedding. Diesel and Tomasello hypothesized that kids should show fewer overt that complementizers. Yeah? In many complement clause constructions, the complementizer isn't overtly there. I think it's in there. Yeah? So there is no overt marking of syntactic subordination of the complement clause. Okay, so coming back to a syntactic tree here, this is what Diesel and Tomasello hypothesized to be the prototype. The matrix clause should be some formulaic phrase like I think or I bet. Yeah? There shouldn't be any complementizer. And the complement clause should not contain any reference that also appear in the matrix clause. Diesel and Tomasello analyzed data from seven different children. Um, so you already know Naomi. Uh, there are six more children here. And those children were recorded in a longitudinal fashion. 
So we have data ranging from about the second year of age until about five years. Yeah? And here in the right-hand column, you see the number of complement clause constructions that were produced by each child. So in total, a database of more than 2,800 complement clause constructions. Now, what complementing verbs did the children use? There's one verb that stands out in the data set, namely the verb think. Okay, So think is used by all children and it accounts for more than 30% of all complement clause constructions. So this resonates with things that I said earlier about constructions having very frequent verbs. So for example, the ditransitive construction, it occurs often with the verb give, or the cause motion construction frequently occurs with the verb put. Yeah? This facilitates learning, uh, this allows uses of the construction with that verb to act as a prototype uh, that serves as the basis for analogies that the kids may make. Okay, besides think, there are verbs such as say, see, know, look, pretend, and a couple more. Yeah, But you see there aren't hundreds and hundreds of verbs. It's just that we have a small set, and from that small set, some are a lot more frequent than others. So on this slide, you see matrix clauses with the verb think as produced by the children Sarah, Adam, and Abe at different ages, between two years, three years, and four to five years of age. Now, the first thing that you can see in this table is that all three children start with the same pattern, namely, I think. So that is a holistic chunk that uh, is very formulaic, just in the way that Diesel and Tomasello predicted. Um, and not only that, it also remains the most frequent pattern throughout the period that is being investigated. So even when Sarah, Adam, and Abe are between four and five years of age, I think is the most frequent pattern. Now, apart from that, of course the children are branching out. They're creating variations on that theme. So for example, you can see that Abe varies the tense inflection on the verb. Think is in the present. Thought, yeah, that's an alternative. I thought. But it's the same pattern in a way, just with the tense being varied. Um, Sarah also produces I thought later in her development. Adam, if you look at Adam's matrix clauses with think, they're really just all in the present tense. So he doesn't vary the tense in these patterns. However, uh, of course, there is some variation that Adam produces. So one other variable that the kids are playing around with is the variable of person. So besides uh, I think, we have do you think. Okay, so we have second person pronouns coming in. Um, and even third person pronouns, does he think. Okay, however, when you look at these patterns, the overwhelming majority is with first person and second person, so the speaker and the hearer, not so much what third person subjects think. So Abe has the people thought, Adam says Paul think, um, Sarah says they think, and so on and so forth. But these are really um, very minor patterns in comparison with the others. So Diesel and Tomasello actually compare frequencies across different types of subjects that you find with think, guess, bet, mean, and know. So highly frequent uh, complement-taking verbs in this database. And with think, you see that an overwhelming majority has the first person singular. Okay, I think. Second person is uh, comes in second. Yeah, you think, he think, they think, and lexical nouns like the people or Paul or doggy uh, that appears very very rarely. Okay, so this is evidence that early complement clause constructions are really highly formulaic, highly centered on the speaker and or the hearer, if we look at uh, guess, bet, mean, and no, you see that the tendency is just as strong. Okay, So with guess, bet, and mean, 
uh, there's a majority for first person pronouns with no okay so there it's actually you know uh, which of course is a discourse marker and that would explain why we have 79 uh, examples of you know rather than uh, I know or he knows or uh, they know okay um, so in conclusion then most early complement clauses have formulaic matrix clauses and as children get older the formulaic matrix clauses exhibit greater variety with regard to different types of subject yeah so first person second person and then third person different types of complement taking verbs so kids are branching out from think to guess to bet and other verbs and different functions of the matrix clause okay with all of this in mind, let me move on to relative clauses. Syntactically, relative clause constructions are noun phrases, complex noun phrases. You remember that with complement clauses, we saw that the top node was an S node, a sentence node. Here we have a noun phrase at the top. And that noun phrase contains a head, yeah, so a nominal like the mouse and as a sister node a relative clause okay so within the relative clause we have a relative pronoun or relativizer uh, in this case it's the little word that okay that can not only be a complementizer it can also be a relative pronoun and then down here we have a clause ate the cheese okay remember our definition of clauses was a verb and its arguments and uh, well cheese that is the object argument of eat and so this is a clause but there's one thing that's a little strange about it namely where's the subject okay um or what is the subject of eat anyway yeah when you hear the mouse that ate the cheese well who's doing the eating exactly i mean you understand this yeah so you understand that uh it is the mouse that eats the cheese, but the mouse isn't expressed overtly in the relative clause, okay? We understand that the head of the relative clause construction reappears semantically as an argument of the verb in the relative clause, but that argument is not overtly expressed. Um, so that's why I put the mouse in gray here. Actually, linguists talk about this argument that isn't there in relative clauses in terms of a so-called gap, okay? So uh, this goes back to earlier traditions of linguistics where movements of constituents were assumed and all of that. We don't have to buy into this, okay? So we can just understand the argument of a verb in a relative clause that is not expressed overtly, but that appears elsewhere and that is understood as the so-called gap, okay? Right, so to give you three pieces of terminology here, the noun phrase that is the nominal core of the uh, larger relative clause construction, that is what we call the head, okay? Then uh, the element that introduces and projects the relative clause that is um, either called a relative pronoun or a relativizer, yeah, because sometimes it's not strictly speaking a pronoun but a different form that uh, introduces the relative clause. And then we have the relative clause itself with this argument that isn't there, the gap. Okay, in this case, the argument that isn't there is the subject of the verb. Okay, and that's why we call this kind of a construction a uh, subject relative clause. <clears throat> so in the subject relative clause, the subject of the verb in the relative clause is not expressed overtly. It constitutes the so-called gap. There are also object relative clauses. So here's another example, the cheese that the mouse ate. Yeah, You see the same principle at work. The relative clause is the mouse ate. Well, the mouse ate something, right? And we also know, we understand that what the mouse ate is actually, well, the head of the relative clause construction, the cheese. So we have the head, the relativizer, 
and um, the meaning of the hat reappears in the relative clause as the gap, this time in the position of the object of the verb. Okay, so that's what linguists call an object relative clause. There are other um, categories of relative clauses as well. There are so-called oblique relative clauses, where the um, position of the gap is one of a, uh, an oblique object, an object that's introduced by a preposition in English. Um, so there we have something like the cheese that the mouse sniffed at. Okay, um, right. Um, subject and object relative clauses are things that we hear all the time. Oblique relative clauses are a bit rarer. And then there are other types of uh, relative clauses that are rarer still. So, for instance, um, the friend that I'm taller than, yeah? relative clause of comparison. Uh, it, it's something that exists, but it is not particularly frequent. Okay, all of this as a general introduction to relative clauses and what they do. Uh, one important addition that I want to make here is that with object relative clauses in English, you can actually omit the relativizer so that the relativizer isn't really there. Uh, the cheese he ate, okay? That is uh, a relative clause, he ate. But there's no relativizer, yeah? We could have it in the cheese that he ate, but we needn't put it there. And uh, the gap would again correspond to the head, and in this case, uh, the gap corresponds to the object of the verb. Okay, so where do we go from here? Actually, let's talk about language processing for a while. Um, there's a little task that I want you to do that relates to the insight that some relative clauses are more difficult to process than others. And, um, here are four examples, and I would like you to judge for yourself which example is the one that you find easiest and which is the one that you find hardest, okay? Um, I'd also like you to categorize these examples as subject relatives or object relatives. And um, if you have to re-watch the last couple of minutes for that purpose, feel free to do so and then come back to this place. Um, okay, so the four examples read as follows. Uh, example one, the detective who observed John was clever. Example two, the detective who John observed was clever. Example three, give me the ball that the girl threw. Example four, show me the ball that hit the girl. So which one do you find easiest? One, two, three, or four, which one is the hardest? Okay, um, pause the video now. I'm going to continue right now. So traditionally, what people find the easiest is example one, and what people find the hardest is example two. Okay, why is that? Well, uh, the traditional explanation has to do with distance between the gap and the constituent to which it corresponds. Okay, uh, that's often called the filler Earlier in this video, I called it the head of the relative clause construction, which is also true. Okay, so in the detective who observed John was clever, that distance is actually very short. Okay, um, the gap in the relative clause is in the subject position. It precedes the verb. And um, so from the detective to the gap position, there's only very little time that passes. So that means we have to hold the detective in mind only for a very, very short amount of time. Okay, so not a lot of effort uh, for our working memory. That effort is a lot larger when the uh, gap is in the object position. Okay, in the detective who John observed was clever, the gap occurs later in the relative clause. So between the detective and the gap, there are three words and several syntactic boundaries where we have to keep the semantic content of the filler in mind until we can match it with the gap, okay? So that means that there's a little bit extra effort that we have to make cognitively in order to process this sentence. <clears throat> In give me the ball that the girl threw, 
uh, similar situation. So uh, example two and three are the object relative clauses which have been found to be more difficult than subject relatives. And uh, in both cases you see that there's a larger distance between the filler and the gap than uh, in the subject relative clauses. Yeah? So in show me the ball that hit the girl again. That's just a very short distance. So uh, there are lots of experiments uh, that provide evidence um, that subject relatives are easier to process. And the explanation simply has to do with working memory. Holding the filler in working memory takes effort, it takes resources away from other cognitive circuits that you could use to process language. Okay, so far so good, but uh, there is trouble ahead. Um, this is a study by Diesel and Tomasello on child language and relative clauses, and they argue that distance between the filler and the gap really cannot be the whole story. Okay, Because if constraints on working memory were the whole explanation, then uh, we should definitely see some kind of signal in that in child speech. Okay, children, their working memory, uh, it's not that well developed. It definitely has a lower capacity than the working memory that, that you and I are using on a daily basis. And so children should produce fewer object relatives or none at all. Okay, and this is not the case. Among children's earliest relative clauses, we find uh, utterances such as, that's the yogurt that I want, okay? So if you were to analyze this, that's the yogurt that I want, that's an object relative, and the uh, gap would be after the verb want here in the object position corresponding to the yogurt. So by all means, that should be difficult, and children should have a hard time producing this or understanding this, but they do it just fine. Yeah, or what's that you have? Yeah, object relative in the form of a question. Children use this without any problems, so that casts a little doubt on the distance explanation. And um, well, one thing that figures is that children's typical relative clauses are different from the kind of stimuli that psycholinguists use in their experiment. Okay, so classic study. Uh, used sentences such as the senator that the reporter attacked responded immediately. Yeah. And that, for many reasons, is a very unusual relative clause construction because all the words in the sentence are full lexical elements. Yeah. Senator, reporter, and so on and so forth. Usually, in relative clause constructions, you have pronouns. Okay. <clears throat> as in the girl that came with us. Yeah. Practically no, uh, okay, just, just one uh, lexical noun. This is the sugar that goes in there, or here's a tiger that's gonna scare him. So um, there's a good reason to think that these artificial stimuli that consist only of lexical nouns are harder to process anyway, yeah? and their object relatives may appear more difficult than they actually are in real life when you use them with pronouns with reference that you're actually already familiar with that uh, constitute common ground between the speaker and the hearer. In other words, we may have an issue of what uh, experimental psychologists call ecological validity. Okay, So do the stimuli actually reflect what goes on in real life? And if they don't, then the study results may not reflect what children know about relative clauses and how they use them. Okay, but how do children use relative clauses? Diesel and Tomasello make two observations. First of all, they observe that most child relative uses are actually attached to what they call presentational constructions. Things like, that's the yogurt that I want. Yeah. With a construction like that, the child directs the hearer's attention to an object, the yogurt, and then they say something about it. Yeah? That's the yogurt that I want. That's a very typical pattern, and so Diesel and Tomasello hypothesize that this kind of construction should be easy for children to process, 
easier than other relatives, such as the reporter who the senator attacked went home or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, second observation is that the relativized syntactic roles, so the different types of relative clauses, subject relatives, object relatives, they differ in frequency, how often the children actually hear them. And so they hypothesize that children's performance varies with the frequency of the different types of relative clause. Okay? The most frequent types should be the easiest, and subject relatives happen to be the ones that are most frequent. And there are other types that are less frequent that should be harder to process. Okay, um, in order to test these hypotheses, Tomasello and Diesel uh, devised a sentence repetition task. So there were uh, English-speaking children, four-year-olds, who were asked to repeat six different types of relative clauses. So um, they used two different kinds of what I call uh, subject relatives. There are so-called S relatives, the boy that ran, where S is a subject of an intransitive action. And there are A relatives, the boy that kicked the ball. That's also a subject relative, but here the subject is the subject of a transitive verb, so there's an object that goes with it as well. Okay, The boy that ran, the boy that kicked the ball, both subject relatives, but they can be differentiated as S relatives and A relatives. Okay, the next category is the one of P relatives. These are patient relatives, so they correspond to what I've been calling object relatives. The yogurt that I want, there the gap corresponds to the object of the verb want in the relative clause, and so that is in Diesel and Tomasello's terminology, a patient of the transitive verb want. Uh, indirect object relatives, the girl that he borrowed a football from, okay, so with where the gap is in this position of an oblique object. <clears throat> he borrowed a football from the girl. Yeah, This is where the gap would be, and that gap corresponds to the head of the relative clause construction. Filler and gap are far away from each other. That should be difficult. Um, oblique relatives, the car that he ran away from, same kind of structure. Genitive relatives, the boy whose cat ran away. Yeah, very rare, um, and so children don't hear this very often. That should be quite difficult for them to repeat. Okay, um, <clears throat> the matrix clause for these relative clause constructions uh, was either a presentational construction, like that's the boy that ran, that's the boy that kicked the ball, uh, or a question, yeah? is that the yogurt that you want? Or it was a transitive main clause, such as I see the boy whose cat ran away. Okay, And the way you have to imagine this is that the child and the experimenter were sitting in the lab together, and the experimenter would say, okay, let's play a game. Yeah? I, say, uh, I say something, and then you repeat back to me what I just said. And the child would probably say, that's a stupid game, but uh, okay, why not? All right, um, of course, <clears throat> this was uh, done in such a way that there was a playful context, in this case, a uh, toy farm yeah, with several protagonists. So several boys, several pigs, several cats and cows and uh, whatnot, so that it would make sense to use these relative clause constructions. Okay, when you talk about the boy whose pig had run away, there must be at least two boys, one who has a pig and the other one has cats or I don't know what. Okay, um, the procedure was that kids were shown this toy farm, the protagonists were introduced, okay, several boys, several pigs, several cats, and the children were introduced to the game of repeating sentences. And not every sentence that the children had to repeat was, in fact, a relative clause construction. There were filler sentences that were interspersed, so that every now and then the child would get a sentence like, is the dog sleeping, or something like that. 
Yeah. Uh, so you cannot give children long sentences that are super difficult and so they cannot repeat a single one that would be frustrating. You have to have uh, a bunch of sentences in there that are easy and that make the game sort of fun. Okay, and all responses that the children gave were transcribed and, uh, well, uh, the accuracy of these transcriptions was checked with the original audio recording. Now, what came out? Um, if you and I were given this task, yeah, someone says a sentence and we have to say it back to them, we would be at ceiling. Yeah? Everything would be correct. But if you do this with four-year-olds, there's a surprisingly high number of cases where the sentence come back sort of okay, yeah, but not quite 100% correct. Um, okay, let's talk about these results. As Diesel and Tomasello predicted, presentational constructions resulted in fewer errors than transitive matrix clauses. So this uh, is an insight that goes across the board of different relative clause types. We'll get to those in a minute. But uh, there is a difference between that's the boy whose cat ran away and I see the boy whose cat ran away. Yeah? So the, that's the sentences. They were easier for children to repeat accurately. At the same time, there was no uh, difference between presentationals and questions. So that's the boy that ran away and is that the boy that ran away? Their accuracy was about on a par. Um, but generally, what this uh, motivates is that hypothesis one is born out. Presentationals are relatively easy, presumably because children hear them a lot. Okay, now let's talk about the different types of relative clauses. And here we have a bar chart with percentages of correct responses to different types of relative clauses. Okay, we have the S subject relative clause, the boy that ran. Okay, this is the boy that ran. And you see this is the highest bar. Yeah, more than 80% correct responses. Here we have the boy that um, kicked the pig. I don't know, uh, the, the boy that fed the pig. Let's do something nice. Yeah, so um, also a subject relative. But you see that there's a difference between S relatives and A relatives. Moving on to the next category, we have the P relatives, the patient relatives that correspond to what I called object relatives earlier. And we do indeed see that these are harder to process than the subject relatives in the S and the A category. So that's good news. Yeah, That's in line with earlier findings. But what is not so much in line with earlier findings is that there is no significant difference between the patient relatives, the indirect object relatives, and the oblique relatives. Uh, why? Well, if we adhere to the distance hypothesis, yeah, in indirect object relatives and oblique relatives, we have a larger distance between the filler and the gap as compared to the patient relative. So there really should be a difference. These should be harder than the P relatives. So that's something that we need to keep in mind as well. On the far right of the graph, we have the genitive relatives, the boy whose cat ran away. And uh, this is a construction that children almost never hear. And so it's really not surprising that there were really, really few correct responses um, in that category. Okay, um, Diesel and Tomasello then went on to have a closer look at children's responses that were wrong, okay, when the children repeated back something that was not the thing that the experimenter had said, and they observed that many incorrect responses followed a certain pattern, namely from a P relative or an IO relative or an oblique relative to an A relative. Let me give you an example. Here we have a test item that goes, this is the girl who the boy teased at school this morning. So that's an object relative. Uh, this is the girl who the boy teased. Here we have the gap. The boy teased the girl at school this morning. And what the child says is this. This is the girl that teased the boy at school this morning. So the child corrects the sentence in a way from a P relative to an A relative. And this is not an isolated case. Yeah? So down here we have sort of a confusion matrix. So we see that uh, most cases really are 
where um, <clears throat> we have a change from a PIO or oblique category towards a simpler subject or agent uh, relative, so S or A. And um, the inverse process from A to P happens only very rarely. Okay, so children prefer subject relatives to object, indirect object, and oblique relatives. Okay, um, children also produce what linguists call resumptive pronouns. So they say things like, this is the girl who the boy teased her this morning. Yeah? In some dialects of English, that is actually how you say this. So object relatives, they tend to develop these uh, resumptive pronouns. Or uh, children replaced uh, the relativizer that with uh, what, okay? That's the pig what ran away. That's a typical strategy in child relatives. And um, it has a model in so-called headless relatives. I don't know what it is, yeah? Okay, so the filler gap hypothesis, the hypothesis that distance explains what is difficult and what is easy is consistent with the fact that subject relatives are preferred and cause the fewest errors. But there are some problems that remain. So although subject and agent relatives involve the same distance, the S-type relatives are significantly easier. Yeah? So there's one argument fewer in S relatives, and perhaps that is what makes them easier to process. Then second, Although the distance between filler and gap varies in P relatives, IO relatives, and oblique relatives, the errors actually are the same. So this casts doubt on the distance hypothesis. And lastly, in gen relatives, there it outright contradicts the uh, distance hypothesis. So in gen relatives, there is a very short distance between filler and gap. So as soon as you hear the word whose, you already know what's going on. It's a genitive relative, but still children cannot repeat them. So clearly distance is not the whole story. Right, um, so going back to the graph for a minute, we might ask ourselves, why is there this difference between S and A uh, relatives? Why is there no difference between P, I, O and oblique relatives? And why is this genitive relative category so difficult? These are puzzles when we assume the distance hypotheses, but these are not at all puzzling if we just go with the frequency explanation that frequent things are easier than constructions that we hear more rarely. Okay, let me come to the third and final part of this video, conjoined clauses. What are they? They are exemplified by utterances like these ones here. I'll take this one and you'll take that one. We could play outside or we could stay here. I want that one, but it is behind the shelf. I like it because it's blue or when it's broken, we need to fix it. In uh, the first four of these, what we have is, uh, well, one, complete clause, I like this, I'll take this one, uh, then there's a conjunction, and then there's a second complete clause, you'll take that one. Uh, here we have and as a conjunction, here there's or, here there's but, there we have because, and uh, these conjunctions, they signal a semantic relation between sentence one and sentence two, okay? And that relation can be one of cause, it can be one of expectedness or unexpectedness. It can be an alternative in the case of or. And with and, there are actually a bunch of different functions that and can take. Um, okay, with when it's broken, we need to fix it. We see a different pattern. Namely, uh, here we have a uh, so-called subordinate clause, when it's broken. Um, and then the main clause, of the complex structure is we need to fix it, okay? So here the uh, subordinating conjunction when signals that the following material is a subordinate clause that is embedded in a larger structure and that eventually there will be a matrix clause that uh, binds the whole structure together. Okay, with regard to the development 
of different conjunctions in child speech. We see that there is a temporal sequence of different types of connectives and different types of meanings. So uh, the way to read this graph from Tomasella's book is that uh, we have age both on the x-axis and on the y-axis. So um, <clears throat> we start with um, two years and two months and go up all the way to three years. <clears throat> and uh, the further we go to the right, uh, <clears throat> the older the child gets. And the further we go up, it's also the older the child gets. And uh, on the x-axis, we have the different connectors, and, and then, when, because, so, then, if, and but. And on the y-axis, we have different uses of those connectors, because conjunctions have different meanings. They can be used in different functions, and and has a whole lot of them, okay? It can just mean that two things add up, two meanings add up. It can also have the function of temporal sequence, okay? I'll take this one, and then I'll take that one. That means that first I'll take this one, and after that I'll take the other one. Um, there's a causal uh, meaning that and can imply. I ate uh, a big portion of spaghetti, and now I'm feeling full. Yeah. So there's a causal relation between those two events. And... Um, there are others that come into play later as children grow older. Okay, um, what we see in this graph is that certain meanings, like causal meanings or epistemic meanings that have to do with likelihoods or probabilities, they come in later than additive and temporal meanings. Okay, so overall what emerges in child speech is a sequence from additive to temporal to causal to adversative. Something interesting about children's early use of connectors such as and, because, so, and, but is that kids don't use them to link two clauses that they themselves produce, but rather these connectors are used to introduce independent utterances. So a pattern that you see very frequently is what you see here. Uh, the child says, you can't have this. The adult replies, why? And the child says, cause I'm using it. Okay, so cause is not there to connect two things that the same speaker produces, but rather it is a tool to link up with a previous utterance. Okay, so it's, it's interactive, it is a linking element, but not in the way that we see it as a syntactic tool that allows us to build a syntactically complex unit. Same thing here in this short exchange, the adult says, this is called the skin of the peanut, and the child goes, but this isn't the skin. Yeah, so, but not as a linker of two things that I am producing, but rather as a linker to an utterance that someone else has been producing. In later child language, um, connectors are of course used to string together several clauses. So this applies to connectors such as when, if, while, until, after, and before. Uh, they emerge a little later and when they do, they appear as linkers between two clauses, okay? So that would be at a stage where children want to tell stories or give explanations. And there, these subordinators, yeah, uh, they are used so that the child can provide further information, background information about a point that they are making. So for example, we find temporal subordinators like when, in utterances such as we sleep here when we take naps. Okay, when we take naps provides background information on the uh, event that is presented in the main clause or he bit his tongue while he was eating. There are reasons of course that these connectors emerge relatively late in child language. First of all, Providing background information requires a fair amount of mind reading. Um, what kind of background information would be useful for my hero? What do they already know? What is news for them? What information should I be providing? That is not trivial and it's challenging for a three-year-old. 
Yeah. Um, likewise, producing conjoined clauses takes processing effort. So planning two clauses in advance, I find that challenging. I can imagine that it's very challenging for a four-year-old as well. Okay, let me summarize what I've been discussing in this video. Here on this slide, you see a table from Tomazello's book where he gives a broad overview of patterns of development in English-speaking children's complex constructions. And the constructions that I've been discussing are complement clauses, relative clauses, and conjoined clauses. And if we go from left to right in the table, we go from two years of age to two and a half to three years of age, which is when this happens. Yeah? So we see that uh, between two and two and a half, no complement clause constructions, no relative clause constructions, and just the bare beginnings of conjoined clauses where two constituents are linked with the conjunction and. Yeah? Um, we looked at early complement clauses and we noticed that they start out with highly formulaic matrix clauses, things like I think, okay? And that these formulaic matrix clauses stay the most frequent option during much of children's early childhood. Yeah? <clears throat> so eventually children branch out, they take more verb types, so not only think but also see and guess and bet and more, and they branch out into different inflections of those verbs and different persons so that they gradually um, resemble more adult uses of complement clause constructions. With regard to relative clauses, we've noted that early relative clauses tend to be presentationals. Okay, So that's the thing that I like. Yeah? So it doesn't really matter all that much that um, those early clauses are not necessarily subject relatives. Yeah? Subject relatives and agent relatives are easier to process for children. Yeah? But in this presentational context, because it is so frequent, children can manage even the more difficult categories of relative clauses. But also in relative clauses, as children grow older, they branch out into more and different categories uh, so that they approach adult usage of relative clauses. And with regard to conjoined clauses, we saw that there is a sequence that starts with additive meaning, proceeds to temporal, causative, and adversative meaning until we get to really complicated stuff like, for instance, concessive meaning, yeah, the stuff that we have with although and uh, conditional if and so on and so forth. Okay. That's it for now. Um, for next time, please continue reading Tomasello. So move on to pages 196 to 224 and uh, be sure to fill out the online quiz number 10. All right, that's it. Hope you're doing well. See you next time. Bye.